And when I look for opportunity, uh, you know, while certain things are saturated for in for instance, the insurance business. Yeah. So not only you have farmers, but you have multiple different companies yep. like State Farm and Allstate, and then hundreds of agents in yeah. those companies. But what I was looking for is what was wrong with the business. From the grit and the grind to successful minds, live from the entertainment capital of the world, your hosts, Jillian Bachelor and Daryl Hamilton. Hey, 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 guys. It is Jillian Batchelor. And Daryl Hanna. And Daryl Hanna, we are with Vegas Real Talk. And Daryl, we have an amazing guest today. Yeah, we do. One of our business partners we are in bed with. You guys, that was a joke, okay? But one of our <laughs> business partners, we have Alex Rivlin. Alex Rivlin is a man of many hats. Not only is he good looking, not only is the best dressed man out there, but he also is an amazing entrepreneur. This guy is a real estate agent, has an amazing real estate uh, team in town, big team in town. He's with EXP. We'll let Alex tell a little bit about himself, but he's also an author. He is a father. He is a, oh, just a coach. I mean, dude, this is my business partner. This guy's amazing. Alex, tell us about you. So, uh, I mean, there's so much to tell. Right? Oh, the man, um, the myth, the legend. So, yeah. Born and raised in, in New York and got that, uh, you know, gritty New York work ethic. Oh, uh, Daryl, that's his problem. Yeah, yeah see, I there knew it. it is. That's a, and, it. And, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm an Android user, so I buck the trends Me too. on all. Me too. Yeah, there you go. All right. Uh, you guys, Android, I'm out. We're out of the Android user. Yeah. No, no, no. So I die. Never yeah. going to be Apple. Yep. So moved uh, moved to Vegas when I was 18 years old. So, uh, so you know, going to age myself right here, but... Uh, I will be in Vegas uh, 30 years this July. Wow. Wait, so, so wait, wait, so you're 38? So that, no, plus 18. 18, 30, so 40. Oh, 48, yes. 48. Okay, yeah. sorry, sorry, Younger you guys. Sorry, I know Damn how to do math, I promise, but uh, <laughs> some days doesn't look like it, okay? Yep. Uh, so moved out and most people ask me, why Vegas from New York? Yeah. And and I always tell them the same thing, in order, opportunity, weather, and school. I love so it. when it comes to opportunity, New York is extremely established. If you're around the city at all, and I was in the city and the suburbs, uh, you know, my mother went to the same dentist that I went to. And, you know, and then when he was passing on his business, it went to his next of kin and uh, you just couldn't break in and start up a business there. So I looked at Vegas as uh, as a ton of opportunity. From And the there is. Yeah, still to this day. It's I, so, so actually, so Daryl and I always say that about opportunity because I was raised, well, I've been in Vegas since I was six years old. And people say to me like, oh, Vegas, Sin City, da, 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 da. I'm like, you guys, there's so much opportunity in Vegas. Anything. I mean, I have friends who are valets who are making $100,000 a year and they were at like 20 years old, right out, of, right out of high school, right out of in college. I have friends who have started the most entrepreneurial businesses, have sold. Now we have the little Silicon Valley that's coming in like southwest yep. part of the valley, right? Yep. So we have tech companies coming, entertainment. There's so much money. Well, to it's be not made. just, yeah, it's not anymore just like the whole sin thing is kind of, it's not gone away, it's still here, yep. but it's, it's so much more than that, right? Now it's sure. like professional football and basketball and hockey and all this other stuff that we just never had before. Yeah, that's the just creating expanding. like it's it's a it's, to me. I was getting ready to leave. I was born and raised here, and I had thoughts, I'm and I'm still thinking about guys. leaving no, at some no, point. No, but no, no. man, it really put my put my plans on hold because it was like, okay, this is kind of a cool place to be now. Like, it's a very cool. It's always been a yeah. cool place to be, Daryl. Well, Hannah, what is going on with yeah, you? It, it was Vegas was a cool place to be until you were about 25. And then it was like, okay, I got to go or I'm going to die. Wait, and now <laughs> your son is in, in hockey and now you're like blowing it up, oh, yeah. right? So, yeah. yeah, Vegas can definitely uh, chew some people up and spit them out. So it, it could be a Absolutely. rough place for yeah. some. But yeah, so I looked at the opportunity and I got out here when I was 18 years old and started a business right away. So you came out here, you didn't come out with your family. You came by yourself? So I, my father came out at the same time as me, kind of a, a, a whole different story that we yeah, yeah, get yeah. into yeah, today. Yeah. Um, and then my brother... Followed us six months later. He had moved to Florida six months before uh, he wow. New York. And then I convinced him to come out here. And then my mother and my sister uh, came out about a year and a half later. Oh, wow. So wow. so my family ended up following me out here. For so what? So Alex, when you moved out here at 18, what business did you start? Because wow. that's really, and did you start it at 18? I think this is interesting. Yeah. So yes, at 18, I actually, because my father moved out here, he was looking for a business to buy. Okay. So him and I went in together and we bought a machine shop and we turned it into a repair shop uh, okay. for auto, for cars. And the cool. machine shop was based specifically in transmission. So we sold transmission parts and rebuilt torque converters. Okay. Uh, and then uh, the business wasn't doing as well as the uh, the owners that sold it to my dad 
led on to. Uh, Wait, that always happens, you guys. We talked about, we talked, we had Jen Weinberg in here selling businesses, you guys, very important to know. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. So then I talked to my dad and said, look, you know, I know how to work on cars. So let's start working on cars. So we, uh, we turned that shop into an actual repair shop and we were able to supply ourselves the parts. So we yeah. were able to make money on both sides of the, uh, of the coin there. And then we, uh, there was an opportunity for, uh, to buy another shop, uh, over on the east side of town. So we bought that. And before we knew it, um, I was 22 years old and I had five shops. Wow. My father had, you know, essentially exited the business and I was running the five shops and did that until I was 26 years old and, uh, really burnt out on that business. Wow. Uh, <laughs> Your first shop, where was it? Uh, it was on Scripps Way, which no longer exists because, uh, yeah, the Rio Scripps took over that land with so it was right behind eminent domain yeah i was just gonna say that realtors domain, the train and, tracks and all that stuff and, back and there they they built that tunnel that goes through the caesars now that twain uh -huh. yeah. yeah over there so yeah. it was right over by uh the sand dollar yeah so the did you actually around. were you yeah. able to sell out in the eminent domain did you get a payday there uh well Alex? so we were we were the lessee okay but as the lessee we still had length left on the lease yeah. so yeah. we did negotiate a uh yeah. I told him. Uh, um, we, it was what's on site. <laughs> we did negotiate a uh, a move fee okay. and uh, and some extra concessions. So, Alex, so I know you well, but I, obviously our listeners and our viewers don't know you as well. And so I know that you're a man of many businesses. And that's one of the things that I actually really like about you is that I believe that when you're an entrepreneur, it, when you have that spirit in you, you could be an entrepreneur to anything. And I, the, one of our other business partners, Johnny Richardson, I mean, Matt Snyder, we're all the same, right? Daryl, when you're a business owner at heart, and you're an entrepreneur at heart, you're gonna find a way. And that's what I think is great about us as entrepreneurs because it's like, I always tell people, if real estate went out of business tomorrow, you just couldn't buy and sell a home. I could sell water, I could sell oh, yeah. string. I mean, I'm an entrepreneur, I could find a way. So tell us a little bit about some of the businesses that you've gone into. And then I really wanna talk about your book. It's already an Amazon bestseller because you guys, I bought like 75 copies myself <laughs> to support my business partner and give them out as, <laughs> as gifts because it's an amazing book, which we're gonna put the link in here. So you guys can uh, do well as well and help our buddy Alex out, but it's really gonna be great for you. But before that, tell us about some of the businesses you've owned. So as I mentioned, auto repair, uh, had one of the largest auto repair uh, transmission shops, five locations in town. Okay. Built that business up really well. We did uh, major fleet accounts like Yellow Checker Star Taxi Cab, Southwest Gas. Wow. Um, so that was a great business. Um, that business, like I said, I was looking for that transition because uh, you know, clients don't like it when their car breaks down and they no. have to fix it. Yeah. I, if I if I thought about it earlier, it's begrudgingly, in life, they I, have to pay it. <laughs> yeah. I, I would have actually gotten it because I love auto repair and I love tinkering and I still love working with my hands to this day. I uh, just replaced a pool pump on the <laughs> house yesterday because. Needed to it be was done. Easier than you know, calling somebody yeah, for it. Yeah. But uh, but I should have gotten into the uh, restoration side. So it's okay. the money that people want to part with. Yes, because they're excited. Yeah, to part with. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I I did that, and then I ended up opening a farmers insurance agency. And I did that from scratch. Well, let me tell you guys really quick about Alex as he gets into this story about farmer's insurance. One of, if not the most successful farmer's insurance agents, this comes from me so I can say it, you guys, um, in Las Vegas. But again, this is because this is a guy who understands and knows business. He's a businessman at heart. And did you know, did you have any background in insurance when you started that business? None at all. Wow. Love it. Yeah, okay. So tell us what made you open up an insurance company. And how did you make it so experience? successful? Yeah. Tell us about that. Yeah, so I was I was really again looking for opportunity, and when I look for opportunity, uh, you know, while certain things are saturated for in for instance the insurance business, yeah, you know, not only you have farmers, but you have multiple different companies yep. like State Farm and Allstate, and then hundreds of agents in yeah. those companies. But what I was looking for is what was wrong with the business, or what yeah. were consumers lacking, what were the focus groups saying about you know insurance agents at that particular time, and it was really about lacking service. And I knew that, especially coming out of something like auto repair and being able to talk to people about something that they who are pissed about. Yeah, and not happy, spending yeah. two thousand dollars to fix their four thousand dollar car, I was like, "All right, I've got this. I could bring some level of service." And you know, if we go back to you know the late Tony Shea, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Love Tony in Shea. Vegas, right? Zappos, uh, you know, he has a a book, Delivering Happiness, mm -hmm. and it was about going to the next level in customer service, where you could call Zappos. And be in San Francisco yeah. and ask them about ordering a pizza. Yep. And they would somehow get a pizza delivered to you. And they were a shoe store, right? Yep. An online shoe store. So I looked at it in the same way is how could I elevate that customer service experience? And as a result, opened a farmer's agency and was ranked as one of the 
top farmers agents very quickly. Uh, you know, just a couple of years in, there's 17,000 farmers agents. Yep. And I made it up to the 38th uh, spot wow. in overall production. So wow. I had a great thriving agency there. And I how, love how that. How long did you that. have that before you sold it? Um, so I exited the business about eight years in. However, I still owned it. Uh, so I owned it a total of 13. Oh, so wow. because he saw the opportunity. So I really like that Alex used that word. And, and you know, you brought up Tony Shea. I love Tony Shea. Tony Shea was a great, great client, friend of mine. I remember being at lunch with Tony Shea one time. And this, this is truly, I said, what makes you successful? He goes, one line, Jillian. I go, what is that? And he goes, I found a way to say yes. So I love that you talk about the pizza story because Tony said, I find a way to say yes. He goes, you remember Nordstrom's back in the day? You can return. Nordstrom's used to have a TV commercial. This is, I'm going to date myself way back in the 80s and 80s or 90s. And it was somebody throwing a uh, tire through the window of Nordstrom's. And because they would say, and Nordstrom's doesn't sell tires, you guys, but they would let you return anything to Nordstrom's because they found a way to get you into their store so they could sell you the products that they did sell. So years ago, that was a famous TV commercial. I remember mm -hmm. as a kid seeing it, that somebody, would, it was an old woman, and the idea was it was funny. She was throwing this tire through the window of Nordstrom's. Obviously, they didn't want you to do that, but it was because they found a way to say yes. They didn't. They never sold tires, but if you needed to return your tires to Nordstrom's, they would find a way to return it to the actual store. That's what they really did, but it was about finding a way to say yes. Well, um, Jeff Bezos has become successful on that with Amazon. He found a way to say yes. So that, that's kind of a good segue. And, and I really feel as a business owner, finding a way to say yes. As real estate agents, there are so many times that clients come to me and they're like, just today, a client that I sold a house to was like, hey, Jillian, we're in town. Our babysitter canceled. Who can babysit for us tonight? That's not real estate related. I sold these people a house a year ago. I immediately text my, my niece, Natalie, and my daughter, Olivia, and I say, hey, guys, client looking for a babysitter tonight. Who can go? This is not real estate related, but they come to me because they're looking for a yes. We well, want to be the source of information, right? I mean, absolutely. That's what makes you the and like my client, um, so that was my client Eric. My client Diana emails me a couple of days ago and says, "Hey, we're looking for a family to foster for this Christmas season." Again, sold them a house two years ago. I am not in the business of you know fostering families, but I love that because I do that a lot. In my entrepreneurial work um, that I do for my philanthropy side. And I said, I found somebody. I connected her with somebody at my church. She was able to sponsor a family. It's about finding a way to say yes. It doesn't have to be real estate related. It doesn't have to be the business that you're in related. So Alex's book, and, I, and we have a copy. I have a copy for you, partner. He, he just dropped this book, what, 30 days ago? Uh, about three weeks. Three weeks ago, you guys. Today, actually. And it's already an Amazon bestseller. His book is called Static. And Daryl, you and I, and really everybody in the world, know about static and the static that Alex is talking about, the static in the world is the noise of the world. What it's distracts pretty, pretty us, <laughs> what pulls us from our goals, what pulls us from our marriage, what pulls us from our lives. I don't care if your goals are to work out and have the best body, to eat good, to spend more time with your kids, to donate more time to your church, to be the best in your business. It's the static of the world that pulls us away. Daryl, have you ever experienced that? Well, I think everybody in the world experiences it. I mean, it's impossible not to. I, you know, for me, it's get your get your face out of the tube, out of the TV, out of the your phone, out of you the know. YouTube. There's a lot of noise where most a lot of the out static. Of that's where it comes from. Mm -hmm. It's like, hey, reengage with your family. Like, sit down and have dinner together. No TV. No, you know, it, it's really there are no phones. phones. Yeah, no that? phones. Like, would you agree to that? Yeah, yeah uh, Alex, tell us about static. What do you want the viewers to know? Absolutely. So, so in static in the book, the way the chapters are structured, I I talk about how our brain actually works, how our operating system is initially programmed in and our belief system, uh, what our core values are as a person, what our core purpose is. And then the static goes from personal static to institutional static. So I do talk a lot about social media, mass media, marketing, um, but I talk a lot about just personal static, which is everything from your parents uh, to your siblings, to your coworkers, your lovers, um, because, and, and society as a whole, because Ultimately, we are hearing information and we're getting advice, whether solicited or unsolicited. And by the way, I, I posit that solicited advice is never actually an ask for advice. It's an ask for validation. Mm. I already know what my decision is. Okay. I just want I you like to that. tell me that I'm right in my decision so I could go on and feel like, oh, no, these three people told me. Even if 100 people told me don't do it. Okay. And three people told me that I did. I feel justified because those three people. Were the Wait, smartest. so that was so good. I, I want to just I want to repeat that one more time because I want to make sure that people actually heard exactly what you said, because as soon as you said it, I felt it in my soul that uh, solicited advice, solicited advice for Alex Rivlin is just 
looking for reconfirmation that the decision that I already know that I want to make is going to be valid. I'm looking for validation of my current decision that I want to make. I want you to validate it so I feel good about it and I can go on. So Alex says that even if 10 people tell you that decision is wrong, but three people say it's right and it's what you want to do, you're like, yeah, yeah, those three people got my back. So, what, go ahead and so do it. what's your viewpoint on that? Is that right or wrong? So, so I think that becomes static, right? And ultimately it's because, especially when it comes to unsolicited advice, it's through somebody else's lens, right? We all grow up differently. Even if you're, even if you have a twin, you end up with different experiences through your friends, through just certain things and, uh, that you interpret differently. Yeah. And so I'll give you an example is that if your parents were born to parents, so your grandparents went through the Great Depression mm -hmm. and they lost a lot in the Great Depression yeah. and they struggled and they were in the bread lines and they went through all of that, then maybe your parents are a little tighter with money and they're misers and they believe that a government job or a great corporate job with a wonderful pension is the absolute way to go because it's more fail safe. And there's security because there's security there. Alex, This is exactly. you're speaking the truth. Keep so, going. So now you decide that you want to be entrepreneurial mm -hmm. and your parents out of absolute love and protection say, Jillian, Daryl, I, I, I wouldn't go that path. Because yeah. they're scared. That's what you should do. It's the unknown. They're now, scared. Now, what happens? One of three things. Either you completely turn a blind eye to what your parents are saying and you forge your path. Which most well, people probably don't. But more likely, you do the second, which is you hesitate, you question, you delay, you go the corporate route, then you end up becoming an entrepreneur a few years later. And you end you up realize, wasting 10 or 15 uh, years of your life. Exactly. Or the third, which to me is the worst, is you just follow their advice based on their lens, not yours, based on their time, not this time, and you end up getting that corporate job and and never fulfilling your dream and living with some level of regret. Yeah. True. So even Which is the parents, worst yeah, thing in the world. Worst thing, regret. regret. Yeah. So even your parents who love you, and I mean, I would hope for most that you have parents that are loving and protective. However, they're seeing it through their lens. So even what they're telling you, is oftentimes static. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's great. That's actually so, that's so true because you know what? I want to talk about that. I love that when you said that, you know, the way that you, you were raised and I was raised with a single mom, very, very humble beginnings. I know we talked about this a lot, talked about this, but I, I believe it's so much of the fabric of my makeup. And so my mom, and, and I'll tell you, until I was 12 years old, my mom never even made $10 an hour. No child support. We didn't have health insurance until I was 12. Secondhand stores were, were absolutely always where we shopped. If we ever were able to go to Ross, it was like <laughs> once a year for Christmas. I mean, I can't imagine being a mom. Even, I get inflation, you guys, but my mom would spend $100 per kid. She had two kids, $100 for Christmas. So that was your total. And, my, and I remember one year, my sister asked for... Um, a bedding sheet. They used to call them bed in a bag. It was like a bed, or like, you know, your your sheet, your comforter set, your pillowcase. And my mom was like, that's $100, Jennifer. I can't get that for you for Christmas because then that would be the only gift underneath the tree. And my sister wanted it so bad. My mom felt bad to just give one kid one gift and she'd be able to give me like five gifts, equaling the same total value. And that's something that stuck with me. It's funny, when I'm buying gifts for my kids this year, I keep notes in my phone to make sure that each kid has the equal number of presents, equal number of value. I never want one kid to get more than the other. And my mom always says to me, like, Jillian, you're the brokest millionaire I know. She says it to me all the time. She goes, you still shop at Ross to buy an $8 shirt. She goes, and you could go to, I don't even, what's the nice store? I don't even know, Saks Fifth Avenue. I've never even walked in a Saks Fifth Avenue in my life, you guys. <laughs> I've never walked in one. Um, she tells me all the time, but it's like you said, it's the static that we were raised with. It's how I was raised. It was how I was programmed. It was society tells me that it's frugal to spend money on expensive things. And now, though, I have a couple of Louis Vuittons, but I I didn't get one until I was in my well into my 30s. Could have afforded 20 of them, and I was and I still walked in the store and bought the least expensive one. I was like, "What's the cheapest one in this store? I want that one." Don't even show me anything else. So I so you say that's the static, right? So yeah, now you're gonna instill some of that to your kids. Yeah, and maybe that's the life they want to live. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's you know maybe it's their core purpose. Maybe it's not. So ultimately, it's it's the the idea of the book is not just to talk about it. It's mm -hmm. to show you ways and exercise exercises in order to calm that static, in order to ultimately, uh, you know, it's it's interesting because I started realizing as I talk more about the book, it's actually a tool to eliminate self-doubt. Okay. And because self-doubt comes as a result of what we believe mm -hmm. 
I'm going to go deep here for a second. Okay, the QR dropping the knowledge. People expect of us what we believe society expects, and what we believe they're thinking about us, or what they think we are. Exactly. We put a lot of weight into things that we really shouldn't. Yeah. So this this is where I go deep. Charles Cooley was an American sociologist. Yeah. And in 1903, he said something that permeated my soul when I read it. Okay. Here we go, you guys. This is big. And and I'm gonna I'm gonna say it, and then I'll explain it a little. Okay. It's I am not who I think I am. I am not who you think I am. I am who I think you think I am. Yeah, no, that's true. Okay, and so my perception of myself is what I believe you think, think of me. me, not actually what they think of me. Yeah, though. it's what I believe they it's think. What I of believe me. they think of me. So if I think, oh, this person doesn't think I'm that cool, or this person doesn't think I'm that smart, mm-hmm. or this person doesn't think I'm that good looking, right? Or maybe not one person, but you know, expand that out. Yeah, I think that you know. Most girls would probably think, I don't know, I'm a six or a six and a half. Now that's my perception of myself, yeah. you know, or wow, I think they think I'm, you know, George Clooney. Then that's my perception of myself. But it's, but that's the wrong perception. Your, your perception of yourself should be your own. Yeah. So this is really yeah. deep because, and I mean, Daryl, you and I have gone over this a lot personally. This is really deep. Like I'll, I'll be vulnerable for a moment, you guys here, and I'll say, I, my perception of what I would believe people think of me, one thing, just give one thing right here, is I would, I would venture to believe that a lot of people think I'm too much because I have a big personality. I'm outgoing. I'm gregarious. I'm, I'm a lot. I'm loud. No, I don't I'm, think anybody thinks you're too much. <laughs> see? Now he's feeding right into it, you guys. So I then absorb that. I take that in and I think, Many times I think, oh, you got to make yourself smaller for this this group, this room. You're too much. You're too big. You're too loud. You're too gregarious. You're too in people's face. You're too much. So a lot of times, and maybe they don't think this. Maybe they do. Maybe it depends on the person. But a lot of times then I find myself trying to mold and fit into what I think this room needs me to be. Daryl, mm-hmm. what is something that you think that people think of you? I don't, I, I think maybe they think I'm not outgoing enough. Um I don't know. I don't spend a lot of time thinking what other people think. I, Ooh, I, I really great. don't care great. what people think, to be honest. I care too much, you guys. I don't care. I mean, I really, I mean, obviously there are times I do care what people think, but overall, I am I really just try to be me and I don't give too much weight to it. And it, when, when I see other people doing that, either whether it be my son or be, you know, one of my friends or something, it really, I, I tend to like talk to them about it. Um I want like I I'm drawn to it like I want to help them or I don't know does that make sense well, it, it does and you know mm-hmm. so in 1913 uh, there was a comic strip that came out called Keeping Up with the Joneses <laughs> oh knew. we use that all the time so we you, say that all the time yeah, you the never knew where that st- saying came from okay it was actually a comic strip dropping right? the knowledge you guys there were, I have a good these, question about that when you're there were all these little elements of it but Keeping Up with the Joneses used to be that we would see that our neighbor got a new car. So we Mm -hmm. want to get a new car. So, yeah. So maybe, okay, it's time, you know, to talk to the significant other about a new car. We see our neighbor got a new wife. You need to get a new wife. Yeah, right. (laughs) But but that was the extent of it because we didn't have social media. Yeah. Now with social media, we see a snapshot of multiple times per day of somebody's life, right? That they did this, that they're on this vacation. They're smiling with their significant other. They're out with friends, toasting, you know, whatever it is. And what we're doing is we're seeing their highlight reel. Yep, it's we're true. Only the best so true. It. And yeah, so we are comparing our behind the scenes with their best of. Yeah. And it's really an unfair comparison. And now we'll take it one step further. God, this, this is, is where so the true. millennials so and the Gen Zs really, really come in. Because uh, Daryl, what you said was really profound that you know that you don't really pay that much attention to it. It doesn't bother you except for in certain situations. But when it comes to the youth of today, I mean, yeah. from basically 35 down, they're not only comparing themselves with the best of, they're ca- comparing themselves with a fake version of the best of. Yeah. What does is, what is Snapchat and Instagram have on it? Filters, filters. a million filters. Right? So now we have people going in for plastic surgery to look like somebody that doesn't even look like the picture they put on the internet. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's absolutely. Well, uh, I remember. Right. It's scary. Level. I want to mention that really quick. I remember being a kid and we had a lot of magazines, beauty magazines, right? And I remember the first time I ever saw on TV that they had Christy Brinkley and, oh, what was the other big model? There were two big models in like the 80s and 90s. And I, Schiffer. No, it was somebody else. And I remember thinking it was the first time I saw a picture of them. 
And they were showing how they edit the photos. And they were showing how they can make their thighs smaller. They could get away with their stretch marks. They were, they were, it was a TV show, I don't know, one of those extra or whatever. And they were showing how they edit the photos of these models, right? Christy Brinkley and I forgot the, Crawford. yeah, Cindy Crawford. That was it. The two biggest Bring models. They were like the world's <laughs> biggest models, right, you guys? And I was mind blown. I mean, I must have been 12 maybe. And I was like, those aren't their real photos. Like they're taking away their blemishes. They're wiping away their their stretch marks. They're, they're making their thighs smaller. Yeah, but I was mind blown phone. because I thought these women were just the epitome of perfection. And it really, honestly, think of Victoria's Secret models. Until just the last 24 months, Victoria's Secret models have been 5'10 or taller, the most exotic, beautiful women in the world, 100 pounds soaking wet, a size 000. And now if you go on Victoria's Secret's website, they actually have women with stretch marks. They have women that are size 12, size 20, size 22, size 26. They have real women with real bodies. They have women with scars on their face. They have real women with stretch marks. They have women with tattoos. And you're like, oh, because that's 90% of the world looks like this, not the 5% that looks like the original Victoria's Secret models. They changed it. You go to Target, Target's website, same thing. Because they're trying to show the world, wait, this is really how bodies look. This yeah. is really how women and, look. And you said something really critical there, right? What you said is you said, you know, these were like perfect, right? They, they were, they, yeah, we they were, were taught that was perfect, right? But again, I will say, you know, we have this saying, nobody's perfect. Mm -hmm. I believe the opposite. I believe everybody's perfect. Oh, that's cool. right. Oh, we all have growth. I like We all have opportunity, but here's yeah. why I say that, Kay. right? Jillian, you're the perfect you because nobody could be you as good as you could be you. That's Darryl, the truth, you guys. You, you, nobody could be Daryl Hannah yes. the way you are Daryl Hannah. For sure. So you are the perfect you. Now, do we all have growth? Do we all have opportunity? Absolutely. Have Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, if you're not growing, you're dying. Mm -hmm. So so take that and, and move forward with it. Now, I'll turn that to where I talked about self-doubt. Mm -hmm. The reason I believe nobody should have self-doubt is because self-doubt is that pressure of what you believe society or others expect of you. Yeah. If you have total ownership of who you are, right? You know what you're really good at, you know what you're really bad at, but you also know where you want to improve. Like yep. You know where you're at at the moment. If you own that, there's no reason for self-doubt. Now, I do talk about something called situational self-doubt. Mm -hmm. So my son is gonna be 16 on January 26th. Happy so, early birthday to him. Yeah, thank you. And so he is driving every day when I pick him up from school or, you know, go yeah. out with him. I let him drive. Now, he's got a little self-doubt driving. Yeah, because he's changing lanes. New but driver. That, exactly. So it's it's inexperience that creates that yeah. bit of nervousness or self-doubt. And I'm okay with that because guess what? You know, a vehicle is actually a deadly weapon used yeah. incorrectly. So I want him to have those nerves. That said, overall self-doubt, doubting yourself as a person. Yeah. I think you should get rid of that. And here's where I go with that. I was, I was having a conversation one day. I was at this mastermind in San Diego and my friend Jennifer is standing right next to me. Now, Jennifer is a master practitioner of something called NLP or Neuro Linguistic Programming, Neuroscience, the way our brain works, the way we talk to others and the way we talk to ourselves. And somebody was talking about, there was a basketball court there and somebody was talking about a basketball game. And I said, I'm terrible at basketball. And she grabs me, she, I'm pretty close with her and she pulls me aside and she goes, Alex, don't say you're terrible at basketball. That's negative self-talk. And she said, say, that's an area for improvement. <laughs> yeah. And I thought about it for a minute and I said, you know, yeah, I, I could see where that would be. However, I disagree with her. And here's why. I love NLP and I, I, I understand where she's coming from and I think she's right in certain in ways. In certain ways. But here's where I disagree. It's that it's not an area for improvement for me because I have zero care or, or interest to, to try to get better to, at basketball. To, exactly. To yeah. give it the time. So I own that I'm terrible. That's not a negative thing to me. It's a statement. It is what it is. Yeah. It's, it's exactly. a fact. <laughs> it just is what it is, right? Yeah. So I'm terrible at basketball and I own that. So if I go out, now I'll play a pickup game. Yeah. We, we go to the gym and, in, you know, that somebody's playing and they're like, hey, we need another player. I'll, I'll play a pickup game. Anybody ridicules me or, or talks about my form or says, you don't know what you're doing. Yeah doesn't bother me at all. There's not even a moment of doubt in that. Mm -hmm. I go, yeah, I know. I'm terrible. I'm not trying mm -hmm. to get better. Yeah. <laughs> like so, I own it. You so guys are okay. good at that. So the things that you want to improve on, you know, I want to get better at speaking publicly. I want to get better. 
Now, but I know where I am. So but you put your energy so into I, that. So I'm not worried about what somebody says one way or another. So that's and something then, you wouldn't want to say you're terrible at. I'm, you wouldn't want to say I'm terrible at no, public speaking. You say, I, hey, that's I'm, an area for I'm improvement. The, yeah, area for improvement. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And when you know where you're at, then it doesn't matter what other people say because you know and you're, and you're giving an honest assessment. Now, if somebody says something that you're not, right? We see it all the time. Somebody yeah. like, you're ugly. You know, you're two very attractive people, right? Oh, thanks. That, that's a projection. That's yeah. a that's a whatever they're damaged with. That goes back to Don Miguel Ruiz's second agreement in the four agreements, right? Don't take it personally because yeah. it's a them thing, not a you thing. Yeah, so yeah, they're yeah. saying it because of somehow that they got hurt before. Maybe yeah. they don't like girls with dark hair because they got Somebody burned, broke their heart. Know, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So in that case, you know, you just have to know to kind of, you know, your rubber. Let you it know, roll on your back. Yeah, yeah. Probably <laughs> let it bounce off. Um, but otherwise, yeah, you could eliminate self-doubt by just owning and taking personal responsibility. for who Well, and what I really want to mention too is I want to, I want to find the power in it, right? So I'm always about like, how do you find the power in every situation? And so like when you were talking earlier about expectations, like how the world has expectations on you or how they see you or how they, they feel that you are. So like, I'm going to use Daryl and I for an example, right? So in my, in my world, if I'm going to use me first and Daryl, the same. In my world, the expectations that at least I feel my family has put on me or my team has put on me or society has put on me or my employees have put on me is they're going to expect that I'm going to get up every day and I'm going to perform. My family expects me to be the breadwinner. My family expects me to bring home the money that makes our house go round. My parents expect that. My daughter expects that. There are multiple households that, that have the expectation of me. So now could I, could I catapult under the pressure? Because somebody said that to me this morning. I was talking to Courtney on the phone on our team this morning at 8 o'clock, and he was like, dang, Jillian, I didn't realize how, many, how much pressures you have on you every single day. And I go, yeah, but I don't really look at it as a negative. I try to find the power in it. Daryl, the same way. Daryl's family is going to expect that he is going to go to work every day and he is going to perform. They're going to expect that he's going to bring home a paycheck. They're going to expect that he's going to keep the household running. They're going to expect that you're going to show up for your son's hockey team and that you're going to coach the hockey team. These are the expectations, right? And so instead of just saying like, and and this is a time of year, I want to be very sensitive about this because a lot of people fold under the, unfortunately somebody who jumped off a bridge today in Las Vegas because they, they folded under the pressure of the expectations of their family, of society, of work, of business. And so like in my life, I just don't look at it as a negative. Yes, there are a lot of people expecting a lot out of me. There are a lot of people who expect that I'm going to do these X, Y, and Z things that are going to allow their life to be easier. And I just wake up every day and I just know, hey, that's the expectation. And that's actually what I find. I take that expectation. I find the motivation. That I'm, that's when we get up every day. I'm going to get out of bed. And there's days that I do just want to lay in bed and just watch soap operas. There's, there's days I do just want to get out of bed. I do feel depressed. I do feel unhappy. I do feel the pressure. I do feel lazy. I do feel all the things. But I got to find that expectation. I got to turn that expectation into motivation. I'm going to be motivated by this. I want to stay home when my kids are off on winter break, but I got to turn that into motivation to fulfill the expectations. Why do you feel about that? I am, um, you know, I was saying earlier about how I don't really care what people think about me, which isn't all the way true because I was thinking I have definitely, when you said keeping up with the Joneses, I went through a period of my life where I was, when I was younger, trying to keep up with the Joneses because I saw my friends who had the big house and the nice cars and then I was like, okay, I want that. I can get those things right now, but I'm going to go lease everything. I'm going to leverage it. I'm going to rent the big house. I'm going to rent, lease the Cadillac Escalade. I'm going to, I couldn't afford those things, but I could go lease them and I could make the monthly payments, even though my nut every month was huge. And if I had a bad month, I was in trouble yep. and that did happen. So- we're talking about static and we're talking about the self-doubt. We're talking about all the things you just said, right? And the people listening, it's like, my question is, and I might answer my own question, like, how do you, how, do you, how do you combat it? How do, how do you overcome that stuff? And I, for me, it was having a good mentor, yep. having people around me. And that, ha that did not happen to me until about four years ago. Mm -hmm. I'm 50 years old. So I think the great <laughs> mentor is absolutely uh, critical, but I'm gonna go, I'll am gonna i go through the three questions that I ask myself. Um, before I hit those three questions, I will say to Jillian's uh, conversation there. Um, so one is, again, those expectations, are they expectations that they have or are they expectations that you believe 
they have. I believe they have. Right. And maybe they so, have too, but so, I believe so that, they have. So that's one thing. And, and people will have expectations. Um, though the other thing that I would ask is you're a highly driven person. I've known you for some time now. Yeah. You're a highly driven person. So let's say, hypothetically, your life went a different route and you didn't have children. Yeah. And let's even say, you know, God forbid your, your parents had already left. Yeah. And uh, so you were literally just on your own. You had some friends, you dated, all yeah. that stuff. Would you be le any less ambitious or is that expectation actually a self-internalized expectation? Yeah, I would say it's probably self-internalized because I've been this ambitious since I was in high school. Exactly. Yeah. So, so, and that's what I would say is, is take people out of their current. You're element. right. Now there are societal things. If you look at the Amish, the Amish look at us as Westerners and go, how could they live like that? But yeah. we look at the Amish and go, how, how could, could they, they live, live like, like that? that? Yeah. Right. You know, without electricity and, you know, so such old school, that was the 1500s. How, you know, why yeah. they, you know, evolved into, you know, newer society. So those are external, those are societal. But I would also posit that if Elon Musk was born 300 years prior to him being born, yeah, he might not be a billionaire, I mean, obviously because money wasn't yeah. at that scale. He might not even be a millionaire though. Yeah, I believe he'd still fully be a visionary though. For sure, if 100%. A visionary might be something different. Gandhi would still be a peacemaker or a peaceful man. Yeah. Um, would he be the Gandhi that we know? Not necessarily, but I do believe that there are certain internal core attributes that we have that make us who we are. Yeah, and it's that's true. That's core purpose. So getting to the three questions, it's pretty simple. The first question that I always ask is, am I making this decision for me or for somebody else? Am I doing this to impress somebody? Am I doing this to people please? Am I doing this because it's just a path of least resistance? You know, if my girlfriend wants to go out and eat tonight, and she wants to go to a I place do. that I absolutely don't want to go to. Am I making that decision for her because I'm going to somewhere where I don't want to go? Yeah. Making it um, to make her happy. I'm making it for me. Now, as long as I'm aware of it, neither of those is wrong. I yeah. may make it for her and I know I'm doing it for her. I'm not doing it really to people please. I'm doing it because. I love sacrifice. That or because it's just easier for me to not have to think through it, go through that decision and spend that time and energy yeah. on, you know, deciding a different place that we're, are both agreeable to. So sometimes I just go with the flow. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's, am I making that decision for myself or somebody else? The second is if the answer to the first is I'm making it for myself, am I making it for myself indirectly for somebody else? So that comes to, okay, so I'm buying this new car and I'm buying it because I love fast cars. I'm not a big truck person. I'm a fast car person. Yeah. Right. But why am I a fast car person? Is it because I watched advertisements years ago, or Magnum PI or something else where he always had the pretty girl. He was always fit. He was always this, this visualization of, as you said earlier, the perfect man yeah. or what have you. So am I doing it? Once again, I may still do it, but I'm aware of why the I'm reasoning. making this decision. And the third question is, does this decision advance me on my path to the difference I want to make in the world? Does this mm, serve my core love purpose? That. Yeah. And if it doesn't, then then it doesn't matter. Now, then it doesn't fit. It does, because let's say I buy that fancy car. And the reason I buy that fancy car is because I think I could belong to some car clubs. That might help your business. And I might actually meet some people that could advance me in business then yes, I'm doing it for others, but I'm still doing it with thir the third answer being yes. But if it's just diverting me, distracting me, giving me two steps back to try, then- Then it's static. Then it's static. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and all oh. of it can be, but the awareness of it makes me, I mean, ultimately, when I discovered I was living in this, what I call lie, you know, I say it in my, in my opening heart speech is that I, that I realized at 39 years old, I was living a lie. And it took me about six years to really unpack it, you know, through talking to coaches, through going to seminars, through reading a ton of books. And when I did all of that and I uncovered all of that, I can tell you from the point, uh, which was about two years before I decided to write the book. So about six years ago, it was a four year journey, few <laughs> months of serious work. Yeah. Um, but, but about six years ago, my level of happiness and true fulfillment, 
I, I can't compare with any other time in my life and it's hard for me to compare with others. I just, I'm always happy. Yeah. Now, do I have moments that some craziness happens? You know, if I get pulled over and get a ticket, am I happy that I'm getting a <laughs> no, ticket? No, no one is. But, but it's a moment in time. It is literally a glimpse. It does not affect my day. Yep. It affects that moment. And when that moment is and over, you're over it. I'm back to the present. I am living right here like Eckhart Tolle says in The Power of Now. I love uh, that. Yeah. I love that. Well, you guys, I definitely want you to go out. I want you to get on Amazon. I want you to buy the book Static. I think it's an amazing read. We're going to put the link here so you guys can, after the episode, you guys can go on there and buy it. Daryl, is there anything you want to add to that before we wrap this up? No. I uh, think it's really good information for anybody listening. It's what I love about the show, right? It's not just about real estate. It's not just about real estate. And really, I feel, I feel like this is like such a self-help because yeah. everybody, I don't care how old you are, I'm going to buy this for my teenagers. I'm going to buy it for my business partners. Everybody gets involved. Everybody has static in their life. All of our static is slightly same, but slightly different. Oh, yeah. And I think you need to read it. We need to clear ourselves. You guys are rolling into 2023. Let's roll in right. Alex, I just want to thank you for being on our show today. Thank You're you. amazing. I want to thank you for being my business partner, choosing me, choosing Daryl. Daryl, thank you for choosing me and vice versa. We are all going to just rock this year yes, and we, we appreciate are. it, you guys. And again, Jillian Bachelor, Daryl Hannah, and we are Vegas Real Talk. Vegas Real Talk. We'll see you guys next week. Thanks so much for joining us. Oh, yeah.